Hey, thank you, thank you, worship team. So who remembered their cups this morning? It's only been three weeks since we last did this. Chuck and Nancy and Sheila, did you just happen to have coffee? Yeah. All right. Well, we have our last week of our series. If you have not brought your cup, didn't even know you were supposed to bring your cup, there are cups in the back. I want you to go ahead and get up and grab one right now. So they're in the back. Grab a cup. There's all different colors, shapes, sizes. And if we run out, get the hard ones. Leave the styrofoam cups for those who get their last. You all have cups? Go ahead and go grab a cup. I want you guys all to have this in your hand as we're talking. Reggie, if you haven't gotten your cup, on your way in. All right. Over the course of the series, we have talked about all different kinds of cups, referring to the symbolism of our life, the cup of our life. And we've talked about um, the empty cup, when our lives are feeling empty. Nothing is in there, and we need that space filled with transforming presence of God. We have the full cup. When there's so much stuff in there, there's nothing possibly more we could put into our lives. How do we manage the cup of our life when it's so full. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Just want to make sure she's all right there. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. And we have sibling cups, cups filled with love. <laughs> it comes in all different forms. We have the chip cup, the cup that I got from my sister. It happened to be chipped on the very week I was talking about chipped cups. Thank you, God. So the chip cups, things in our lives that don't go well, we fill chips, and then we have the completely broken parts of our lives, those parts that we don't think are fixable at all, that have been broken for a long time, and no matter how many times we try, it can't seem to make it happen. We put tape and all sorts of stuff on it, and we really, truly realize in those places we need God more than ever. Well, this morning, our final series, we're going to be talking about the blessing cup. And the blessing cup is a cup that God offers us. And this, you can't see it, but it's filled with water. If I were to move it even an inch, it's so full, it spills over. And that's the kind of God we have who gives us blessing upon blessing, no matter the condition of our lives, no matter the condition of the cups of our lives, God continually pours into us his blessings. So we're going to be talking about that today. It's interesting because we just finished uh, talking about resurrection last week. And we realized that resurrection was a blessing of blessings. It assures us that, again, no matter the condition, no matter the despair, no matter the darkness in our lives, no matter the loss or death that we have, the brokenness, that it does not have the final say. That's what we celebrated Easter. And what a celebration with our very own actors amongst us, the Sanhedrin and the law experts from Rome and our, our very own newscaster and many, many in between who were on site, uh, on, out in the field reporting. Um, but so what a great celebration, right? Out of the tomb, behind the tomb, behind the stones of our lives, we realized God was still at work. Still his power overcame the darkness and the death and despair. Well, that was... Saturday or Sunday, but then Monday hits, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and the week comes at us with life's same old, same old, or we get an avalanche of reality that hits. The disciples experienced the same, didn't they? They experienced the same. They were riding high when Jesus entered Jerusalem. This was finally the moment. The king was coming. He was now going to take over. And then he got killed. But then, resurrection, right? And so then things are riding high again. Great, resurrection. He's back here with us again. And then, after about 40 days, wasn't it? He ascended into heaven. And they had to say goodbye again. And reality hit as they were on their own with the promise of Holy Spirit, with the promise of blessing and power. But what they had to do is they knew, even though they knew resurrection life was theirs, was here, they'd seen it with their very eyes, 
they still experience now loss and questions and unchartered territory again. And they too, like us, after our big Easter celebration, life hits and we have to figure out how do we hold on? How do we hold on to that resurrection kind of life? How do we hold on to our God of resurrection, our blessing of blessings, even when they seem to dis disappear as soon as Monday hits? It's hard to remember the blessings when we're getting blasted with realities that look far from triumph and resurrection. I think that may be one of the reasons why Jesus took the time before his death to equip his followers, to equip us included, with how to make it through after resurrection when the Mondays come around. In Mark 14 and Luke 22, we find Jesus before his death leading his disciples in the Passover dinner with a twist that makes a little bit, a lot of it, a difference. We know the story well, right? Jesus has them at the table. We read how Jesus takes the bread. He breaks it. He says, this is my body broken for you. He takes the cup and he says, this is my blood poured out for you. And he says, this cup is the new covenant. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. This cup represents, is symbolic of the new covenant, the new way to life, the only way for you to have life through me through my love for you, through my strength, through my grace, my life poured out for you. And so then he offered the disciples the bread and the wine. He invited them to eat and drink, to take these truths into the very core of their beings. And he says, now do this, implied going forward, now do this in remembrance of me. When you look at the actual words of those last instruction, the more accurate translation of do this in remembrance of me, the more accurate translation, translation would be better read, do this, and it will make you remember me. Do this, and it will cause you to remember me. God knew then, and he knows now in our world that we live in, we need to be reminded to remember. When Moses was at the end of his days, when he was at the end of the days, he said of God, you have begun, just begun to show me your greatness and your strong hand. What God is there in heaven or on earth who can do the deeds and mighty works that you do? And then he instructs the Israelites to remember in Deuteronomy 4, 9, be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. And Moses, he clearly knew through the instructions of this sort that he gave over and over, he knew the Israelites beyond him were going to be facing battles. The Mondays, the Wednesdays, the Thursdays were going to hit. And so he reminds them to never forget the blessings that God has poured out into their lives so that they could make it through, not by their might, but by God's. You skip ahead to the New Testament, and you've got Jesus in his last days. And what does he do? He does the same thing. He knew well that the disciples and us, things were going to get tough really soon for them and throughout their lives and our lives on earth. He told us in John 16, you will have troubles in this world. That is reality. You are going to face those Mondays and Thursdays. Jesus knew his disciples would face tough times and would need a reminder of where to look for life. He knew that we would need a reminder to remember even, to remember the who that would get us through, whose whole life was about being poured out so that we could always experience the blessings of hope, of peace, of joy, of transformation, even in the midst of our battles, even after Resurrection Sunday has passed. Jesus knew if we did not take time to pause and remember 
than we would forget. How true is that for our life? And maybe he was influenced, that line, maybe he was influenced by the Greek minds of that day. Or perhaps he influenced them before he got there. But the Greeks had a term that they used, an adjective. Whenever they talked of time, they used a particular adjective to clarify its role. And for the Greeks, time was that which wipes out all things. Cheery bunch of people the ancient Greeks were. Time was that which wipes out all things. They saw our minds as slates and time was a sponge that wipes it clean. Well, I think they're not far off, really, are they? We all have experienced that we just know there are things in our life we will never, ever forget. There are people in our lives that will never fade from our memory. People dear and close to us will never fade. And how are those details lining up now? Some of us just wish we, you know, had at least a month to remember before it was erased completely or a week or a day. But we all have that experience that time has a way of helping us or having us forget. And so it is especially hard to remember, especially our minds, it seems, get instantly scrubbed when we're in the throes of those Monday-esque woes, when they're in the midst of those battles. We've had resurrection on Sunday, but our memories go on Monday. But God is amazing. He doesn't just leave us to our memory of his blessing, though we'll get back to that. But even in the midst of the battles, even in the midst of the battles, he continues to pour blessings out to us. What stories in the Bible? As you're thinking of different Bibles, the Bible's chock full of them, of stories where at first the blessing is hidden, obscured by the situation or the person or the belief system that they hold. Situation maybe looks ominous. Maybe in, in the middle, midst of it, in the middle of it, it's very grim. Towards the end, it seems for sure death or darkness will win. But then, despite it, or because of it, or through it, or in the midst of it, or on the other side of it, there is blessing poured out from God. And sometimes that comes in the form of his power, sometimes his provision, and most always his presence. Can you think of stories in the Bible? I, honestly, I'm not sure if there's one story that doesn't have a blessing associated with it. You know of? Shadrach in the midst of the fire. Yeah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What other stories where it looked ominous and blessing came out, even in the midst of it? God showed up in the midst of those flames. The big ones. The, the Bible. Yes, Shepherd. Joseph. Joseph. Yes, we were just talking about that in the study group this morning. Joseph sold to slavery, thrown in prison, falsely accused. And yet, blessing came out of that. The Israelites, the Red Sea, they're escaping, yay, and then they face the Red Sea, not so yay. And then the Red Sea parts, yay. Lazarus, yeah, were you going to say Lazarus? All right. Resurrection happened. Surely he was dead, dead, dead. Four days later, he was not. The small ones, Ruth, the book of Ruth, struggling without home. Without a country, she finds her true love in a wheat field. The widow, the widow who had no oil left. It's a drop of oil left, and she gives it the worst time of her life. She has nothing more. She gives it to Elijah. She gives it to the prophet, and she thinks she's ready to die, and God replenishes the oil day by day by day. Zacchaeus, hopeless failure, can't see above the crowds. All he wants is just to get a glimpse of Jesus. He climbs up and he ends up getting to spend the whole afternoon with Jesus. These stories, and there's just throughout, I would challenge, look at the stories and see. Yes, it looks grim, it looks horrible. Where's the blessing? Because I guarantee God is the God of blessing. God continually pours out his life, his love, his power, his provision, his presence to us. I don't believe there is a story here that we will not see blessing out of. And the same can be true in our lives. 
It's not always clear right away. We have our chips and our brokenness, our broken and barren places. And yet, blessings come. The battles are not the blessings. I'm not going to say death is a blessing or brokenness is a blessing. I'm not going to say those struggles that we face are the blessing. The despair, the darkness, that's not it. But with God, he always finds a way for the blessings to emerge, to be shaped out of those places. I like how Joyce Rupp, she writes of the biblical passage of Jacob struggling with the messenger, a messenger of God. And and she calls it a symbolic story of our own struggle, our own struggle with those unwanted parts and seasons of our lives, those battles that we really would rather not have to face in our lives. All during the long night, our own dark times, Jacob wrestles. He wrestles with this unknown figure. How often do we wrestle with those unwanted life experiences? Jacob is wounded in the process, much like for us, life just sucks sometimes. That's the reality. But as strong as we are, we know we will affect us. We will have troubles in this world. But Jacob is wise enough to say to the angel, I will not let you go until you bless me. And what if that is our prayer as well in the midst of our battles and struggles? God, help us find the meaning, the purpose through this. Give me hope. Give me some wisdom, something good out of this struggle. And Jacob, he goes away limping, not entirely unscathed. Life affects us, but he is wiser than he was before the struggle began. Sometimes the pain of life doesn't make much sense, but usually, I would say always with God, he finds disguised in the midst of that blessings that he will eventually come, he will bring to light as we are able to let go. And as we let go, just like Jacob did, he fell into the arms of the angel. We fall into the arms of God as we let go. And we are reminded that the greatest blessing was with us all along. And the healing then begins. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Psalms 36 goes on to say, How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. This is my blood. This cup is my blood, my life poured out for you. He says in John, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks and offered it to them and they all drink from it. Do this and it will make you remember me. It will make you remember my power, remember my provision, remember my presence. And no matter, God says, no matter how hard it gets and it will get hard, you will live. You will remember my blessing, my love, my life continually poured out for you. And you will find life and strength and hope once again. Resurrection provisions were being set even before Christ had died. Provisions for our own resurrections. Eat, drink, and remember, Jesus says. Take in my life again and again. Drink from the cup of blessing, from the life of the blessed, and you will live. We're going to do that now. 
We're going to eat the bread and drink of the cup and remember the blessings of God. In those times, back in Jesus' time, the Passover meal, let me just clarify, we get one snapshot of one cup and one breaking of the bread that, that happened. But the Passover meal that they would have experienced then was far different. It wasn't just once eating and drinking and remembering. It ran more like this. They drank, they ate, they praised God, they remembered the goodness of God. They drank some more, they ate some more. They washed their hands, washed their hands some more, washed their hands again. They drank, they ate, they drank, they ate. They remembered and remembered and praised and praised. It was indeed a feast a feast of thanksgiving, a feast of remembering God. You read this and you walk away realizing this is not just remembering God's body and his blood. This is remembering his heart, his essence, who he was, what I've done in your life, the blessings poured out. So you will know in looking back, you will remember because you've looked back that there will always be a way forward, no matter what Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday hits in your life. So that's what we're going to do today. It's a different kind of communion, and I, I dare say perhaps a little more authentic version of it. Certainly in keeping with Jesus' words, do this so it will make you remember me, the blessings poured out for you then, now, and forever. So this is what I want you to do. I invite you to gather into groups of five, no more than five, groups of five. And um, once you gather into your groups, find a spot separate from each other, and I'll give you your next step. So if you just gather with people near you or mix it up, get with people not near you, that's good too. So we have Groups of five. You, you can stay in your group of five. You can separate and mix it up. But I want to see groups of five. Yeah, that would be perfect. All right. So we've got a group there. Let's see. Maggie and Angie and Ernie. Let's see, we've got five here, we've got five there. So we may have a couple groups that have either three or we can, you guys can divide up into some of the other groups. And Nelson and Dawson, you're welcome to join us. You don't have to stay back there. You could form your own group with Maggie and Angie. <laughs> All right, so here is what I want you to do. The head of the household, now which is the group here? This is too big. This is too big. This needs to part the seas. So we've got, how about four and four? Can you do that? So, okay, so Angie, Maggie, Ernie, Shepard. And then George. Why don't you guys separate out George and Maria and Ted and Maria and Ida? Can you guys find a separate spot? All right. Okay, <laughs> you guys really don't want to move very far from your territory. <laughs> this very uh, Israelite nation-ish here. Okay, and you guys are a group right here? Okay, so you're, what? Kids don't count. Oh, kids do count. <laughs> kids count in the remembrance. So what you're going to do is you're going to form, you can separate your chairs out. We have plenty of time to do this. You can separate your chairs out so you form a circle together. And you're going to find out who is the oldest in your group. And that is going to be the head of the household. Okay, doesn't always mean the gray head. Okay, so move your chairs so you're seeing it, sitting in a circle facing each other. <laughs> All right, there you go, making it happen. Good deal. Good, excellent, excellent. All right, if you do not have mugs, you'll definitely want to make sure you have a mug or a cup. And those are in the back. So whoever is the oldest, oh, you guys are going to go get your mugs and cups? Make sure you have your mugs and cups. It's essential for drinking. You don't want to all drink out of the same bottle. 
Okay. Okay, so who's the oldest? Back here. Ah, Chuckus. All right. How stand up, head of the household. Who's the oldest over here? Ah, Evis, come on up. A woman. Yeah. Come on up, Evis. Who's the oldest here? You have to compare numbers. It's a fine line. <laughs> Ted. All right, Ernie, we knew that. Yeah. Come on, come on up front and Oh, older than Sheila. All right, then. Okay, so as head of the household, you are going to grab a bottle of fake wine. We're all going to be drinking this whole bottle. I want to make sure it wasn't real wine. I want you walking out of here. So we have sparkling grape juice. Each take a bottle, take a, take a bowl of bread, take a pen, and take an orange sheet of paper. Can you... So you've got a bottle, got a bottle, bread, paper, pen. <laughs> if we have any background music, little bit, that would be great. We can, we'll put the chairs back in place once we, oh sure, I'll, I'll take the empty bottles. It's Earth Day, we will be recycling them. <laughs> so tell me, what was your experience of this communion? As your cup, did you remember Jesus and his blessings? What happened to your cup and your heart? Blessing was remembered after blessing as we remembered what God does in and through our lives. Our cups run over. You know, have you guys ever, I have a, a bird bath in the back of my yard and there will be debris that will gather in it. And I'll go out there and I'll, I'll want to clean it out and it gets all gunky and yucky and it's a mess. And then I discovered something. If I take, because I want to refill it with fresh water for the birds. If I take that water and I just spray that water into the, the bird bath, all the yuck that is at the bottom, it surfaces and it overflows and goes out over the edge of the bird bath. And pretty soon, because of the water that I pour into the bird bath, displaces the debris that was in there. And I think about for our own lives, there are things that are battles or struggles that get us stuck. We get focused on the debris in our lives. And God says, remember me. Let me fill you up because as you fill up on me and you remember my blessings and I pour into you at all times, that will come out, up, and over the edge and away as you need it to be, as I need it to be in your life. His blessings displace our despair. And that's who God is. He is a God who is our cup of blessing over and over. At the close of Passover, there are two short prayers that they send, and I'm going to close with us this morning by a combination of those two prayers. The prayer goes, The breath of all that lives shall praise your name, O Lord our God. Let them praise and bless and magnify and glorify and exalt and reverence and sanctify and scribe the kingdom to your name, O God, our King. For from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And beside you, we have no King. Beside you, we have no Redeemer or Savior. It is good to praise you and pleasure to sing praises to your name. Amen and amen. May you go forth from this 
table of remembering, remembering who God is in our lives, a cup of blessing pouring out. And as we are filled with him, may that love and power and presence spill out to those God brings us to in our worlds. Amen.